Um, so we've got lots of speakers, lightning pitches, um, all sorts uh, this evening. So I am just going to introduce Clara and Nassos. Clara and Nassos, can you come up? Yeah, there you are. <laughs> Clara and Nassos, senior data journalists from the BBC, are going to talk about their revamping of the entire graphics package, I believe. So I'm going to give you one of these mics. Um, that one should be on. Clara Nassos, I'm sorry, I'm not going to attempt your surname. It's, <laughs> it's probably wise. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> cool. So, um, hi, everyone. Um, and thank you very much to everybody at Hacks Hackers for inviting us here to speak tonight. Um, my name is Clara, and this is my colleague, Anassos. And we both work as data journalists at BBC News. And a couple of weeks ago, we open sourced all of the um, all of the tools that we use for making static graphics. Um, and Hacks Hackers asked us if we would come here and talk a little bit about that, and a bit more broadly about kind of how we work with visualization overall. Um, so we we published our kind of first chart that was made start to finish in our on the BBC News website just under a year ago now. And today we probably have about 15 people on our team who are kind of working regularly producing graphics in R um, on a daily basis. Um, and I've fully lost track of how many, how many charts we've made using this workflow. Um, so it's been, it's been a pretty quick transition for us. It's been a remarkably smooth transition. I think there's a bunch of reasons for that that we'll get into, um, that we'll get into shortly. Um, but first of all, I just very quickly wanted to address this. Um, because I know that there are lots of people in the room who are very familiar with R and who also probably work with it um, regularly. But for those of you who are wondering what I'm talking about, um, R is a programming language. It's a statistical programming language um, that we, within the BBC News data team, um, just as within a lot of other newsrooms, um, we use for kind of analysis and for uh, now for visualization as well. Um, so. When we make graphics in R, um, we do that using a an add-on package, which is called ggplot2. Um, so we kind of, when we're saying that we're making graphics in R, we're talking about using R and using the ggplot package. Um, so let me show you a couple of sort of recent examples. So these are all sort of charts that we've published recently that were made sort of start to finish um, using R. And as you can see, R gives you a lot of like freedom to play around with different um, different visual styles. It lets you like it has lots of different chart types for you to try out, um, and just generally it lets you kind of experiment quite a lot with how you want to tell a story with your chart, which I think is a really good thing about it. Um, which we'll get into a little bit more detail um, very soon. Um, I just first wanted to go back and like give you a bit of backstory and take you back to where we were in the team before we started working with R. Um, so we, um, within the data team, we were using R for kind of analysis work, and we had been for quite a long time. But when it came to making charts, uh, making graphics, we basically had two options. So if it was like a really quick turnaround thing, we'd make it ourselves using the in-house chart tool. Um, or if we had a bit more kind of lead time for something, then we could commission a chart from our designers. Um, we might use, we might have used kind of R for graphics as part of our data analysis, so to, to like do an exploratory chart basically, um, or maybe we might have done like a prototype of a chart, so like sketch something out and then take that to a designer and say, please make this pretty, make this something I can publish. Um, so what we started thinking was that it makes more sense, it's a lot more like it would be a much better workflow and more efficient if we could do everything in one place. Um, if we could kind of go from the analysis step to the kind of publication ready chart all within the same, within the same tool. Um, so that's what we did and we found a lot of benefits to working this way. Um, I've tried to kind of group them together into the sort of three, three main, main buckets. Um, so first of all, this kind of workflow that I'm describing, it's a lot more convenient for us. Um, also like editorially, um, working with R is a lot more kind of flexible and it gives you a lot more freedom in terms of how you want your chart to look. And then finally, because we're working with scripts now, it means that everything is so much more reproducible. Um, so let me just go through those in a tiny bit more detail. Um, so within the data team, as I was saying, we were kind of already working 
with with R for the analysis side of things. So instead of having to um, instead of having to kind of do the analysis first and then think about how you want to visualize it and then take that idea to a designer and have that like back and forth. Um, instead, we can kind of do everything in one place. Um, and that just means it's a much faster and much less clunky workflow. Um, it's just smoother overall. And actually, as an added kind of bonus as well, um, working in this way means that we've kind of freed up, that designers have been freed up so that they can focus more on, instead of having to do like lots of bar charts, um, they can kind of focus more on sort of bespoke illustrations and graphics and things like that. So it's been a win-win. Um, the other thing is that kind of working, working with R is a lot more, it's a lot more flexible. So um, we do have, as I say, we have like an in-house chart tool, which is super quick and super easy to work with. Um, however, because it's mostly sort of intended for reporters outside of our own team, it's very, very kind of locked down in terms of the options that you have. Uh, it's very limited. So you can basically make a bar chart or you can make a line chart and that's kind of the end of your choices. <laughs> um, so that can be a bit frustrating. Um, so now instead in R we can make the same chart, we can make a chart as quickly and as well, like we have so much more freedom to kind of think about what we, uh, what we want to include in that chart, what we want to, um, how we want it to look. We have a lot more control over that. So as you can see, it makes it really easy to like add annotations, to highlight bits of the data that you think are specifically important. Um, as you saw with the examples I showed before, there's just lots of different kind of chart types that you can create. And like R makes it possible to, as NASA has done in this example from the World Cup, makes it possible to add a football goal behind your data if you want to do that, which our in-house chart tool does not let you do. <laughs> um, so I think editorially, that's a really important point. Like it just, make, it just lets us like tell much better stories with our charts. Um, the final thing is kind of, this is can kind of like a workflow um, thing. So because we're now kind of working with script, so we write code, that generates the that generates the chart. Um, that's just like a game changer in terms of um, in terms of data that's going to need updating. Um, so instead of having to remake the chart from scratch every time that it needs to be updated, you can basically just load in the new data, you um, rerun the script, and your new chart is ready, and it just takes a matter of seconds. Um, so this is an example from when UK companies had to report their their pay gaps. Um, last year and um, in the weeks leading up to the deadline I was like I was remaking this chart daily and if I had been doing that manually it would have been incredibly time consuming and tedious um, but because we were working with scripts it it took like a matter of minutes every day um, <clears throat> One thing that I just really quickly wanted to say as well is that we're kind of moved beyond just working with charts and we're doing a lot of our kind of static maps in R as well. Um, and we've seen, we've seen a lot of kind of the same benefits as we, that we see with, with uh, charts. So as you can see here, it's quite easy to kind of add annotations to kind of highlight specific bits of the map that you think are more interesting. It's easy to make small multiples. Um, and as you can see with this, uh, this hurricane map, this is, a, I think, a good example of how it can be used to kind of plan for breaking news. So we had a script prepared that would create a hurricane map and to update it, literally all you had to do is, um, is download the, or paste in the URL that would download the latest shape files from the National Hurricane Center and you'd have a finished and updated map. Um, so one thing that we just had to overcome when we kind of started working with uh, ggplot was um, that we had to start to think of a way to kind of break, through it, break free of the default settings um, so for those of you who, who already work with ggplot, you'll be very familiar with this. Um, the kind of default theme, the default look of ggplot is quite horrible. <laughs> um, um, so the good news is that there's kind of no limit to how much you can tweak and modify that. Um, so what you see on the right here is how that chart actually ended up looking, um, the published chart looked. So, and, and we could make all of those changes directly in R. So we didn't have to kind of take it out to another program like Illustrator and make changes afterwards. So it's quite flexible in that sense as well if you want to make changes to the style of the actual, the actual chart. 
Um, so with that said, I'm going to hand over to Nasso, who's going to talk a bit about the package that we have created. Um, awesome, yeah. Um, so basically, as, as, as Clara just sort of talked you through, we're at a, we got to a stage where we could break free of the ggplot to default, the sort of um, ugly looking, very science journal-y looking charts. Um, and um, working together with, with our design team, we managed to sort of get to a stage where we would, we'd written the code that essentially helped um, to get our graphics produced in R looking exactly like a graphic um, that you'd normally associate with uh, the BBC News website. So um, sort of clean and um, sort of with fonts that are readable, works well on mobile. Um, we got to that stage working um, in R. So we, would, we, we, we were able to produce the graphic 100% in R. Um, what we then needed to do, um, the next step for us was to actually make a better workflow for ourselves. So we'd all been working with, w w together with designers. There were loads of different scripts lying around as we'd sort of um, tried to develop the style a bit more and get everything right from font size to sort of grid lines and everything that goes, um, that you normally associate with a graphic. Um, and as we'd um, got there, the, the, the next step was to make it into an R package. Um, what's an R package? It's essentially a collection of sort of functions in code um, that do really simple tasks kind of very efficiently. So all the code that you'd, you'd um, we'd use to style it, I'll show you um, a couple of examples later, were just sort of turned into one lines, which we could then run every time and we'd get the same result. Um, and what was the target that we had in mind to that made the need for a package. Essentially, by making the package, it, it meant that it could be hosted centrally. Um, the code that every time we, there was an update, everyone in the team could update it at the same time, um, which meant that we had a consistent BBC style. We weren't working off different versions. Everyone was working off the same version of, um, a, a, of a graphic that looked very much like you'd expect a BBC news graphic to look. All the chart furniture, like the title alignment, the logo, the BBC sort of blocks, the source text, um, that was consistent, whatever the dimensions or the size of the chart. Um, and the other thing that was really important to us, and the reason we, um, um, one, one of the reasons to make the package was um, because we could produce export the graphic through one of the one of the two functions that I'll go through now, we could produce the finished version 100% in R from start to finish without needing to export it into another bit of software. As Clara mentioned, sort of that's so much more convenient in our workflow. So we didn't have to bring it out into Illustrator, which is the uh, Adobe Illustrator or any other sort of um, soft, similar software that um, the design team sort of would use initially to produce the graphics um, that we'd been making in the past. Um, so this is essentially, um, w one of the goals was to make it as simple as possible to use, and we'll get into sort of how that really helped um, in a bit. Um, all, the, all the different sort of arguments to style it, there's many more than this, this is just a little snapshot on the right hand side, um, is what it is what it is, uh, what, what the function behind it is, but now you simply add BBC style line into your code and it sort of um, cleans it up for you, it makes it into a BBC style graphic, um, and, and that's, um, the first function. Um, the second function is to finalize the plot, sort of to export it, which again, looking at the really complex code that we spend um, a lot of time sort of um, pulling our hair out to try and get right so that it worked reproducibly across a range of graphics, whatever the size and whatever type of the graphic, ends up being just a function with sort of five arguments that we, uh, we just need to define those. Um, so that's kind of, that was the idea, make it as simple as possible to use. Um, and how did we sort of get, get to this level? How did we sort of essentially um, manage to succeed? I think one of the main reasons that um, when talking about it afterwards we realized is that um, one of the reasons we've, um, w we managed to sort of transition from um, previous workflows to using R for graphics was that this wasn't, the transition wasn't the responsibility of a single person. This wasn't assigned to a single individual. It wasn't given to like one data journalist to sort of squirrel away and work on for like six, seven months and come up with a solution. It wasn't given to sort of a product manager to bring it together. It was a, a team effort. So we um, really started using our um, data team Slack channel. We sort of started um, sharing loads of bits of code amongst each other um, and each member of the data team sort of built up a little bit of the function um, that each person sort of um, built on 
the other person's work, and we really, really um, um, sort of work together to get there. Um, and another thing that's important to note, the sort of um, brackets sort of, um, it involved a lot of Googling, a lot of sort of searching on Stack Overflow, looking through tutorials, trying to find like what people much cleverer than us um, had solved already and written about. Um, so it wasn't anything sort of brand new. It was just kind of making things work for us and bringing them together in one place. Um, and the added benefit is th of that is that we got a lot of skills along the way. We've all kind of really improved what we can do with our, a few months ago, we really had no idea how to make an R package. Now we're sort of developing more and more of them to help our workflow as we go through data analysis and visualization. Um, and as a result of that, yeah. Um, and as, as, as a kind of result of that, we've, um, as the way we were working together, we, um, as we were developing our code and our skills, we were essentially collating um, everything we've learned into an internal reference manual, um, where when one person found out how to sort of left align the title text or how to add the BBC blocks to the, to the bottom right hand side of the chart or how to add an annotation to the chart, they would sort of put the code that they'd use to do this in a, a basically the recipe in an internal cookbook, which is what we've developed and, and one of the things that we've um, open sourced last month. Um, so the purpose of the cookbook essentially is to kind of just host bits of code um, that we use to produce different chart types. So if we're talking about sort of um, all a, a few of the different chart types that you saw, there should be, if you look through the cookbook, um, a way to make it in there. Um, as well as that, there's little bits of code to do tasks like um, adding an annotation onto your plot or adding sort of those swoopy arrows that, that, that you see which help sort of highlight a certain point in the, in the chart or coloring your sort of bars conditionally based on the data. There's a little snippet of code to solve a whole number of um, tasks so that people don't have to try and remember where they did that and cracked that problem three months ago on a previous project or where, or sort of trying to get in touch with the data journalist who produced the chart which was like, with um, which had a, which, a, a particular type of chart essentially. It's all in there so you could just search it and you don't have to sort of go back um, and talk to, you don't have to talk to anyone essentially, which kind of helps. Um, and I think this is sort of, as a result of our trans transition into R and what we've done, um, and as people in the wider um, visual journalism team, so beyond the data journalism team, um, um, they would see sort of how we were producing sort of high quality, really clear, um, nicely annotated charts um, really quickly. They um, sort of wanted to, um, uh, they were really interested in how we could do that. Um, so, and sharing the cookbook with them made them realize that it's not an insurmountable sort of task to get to grips with it. We were providing a lot of the code already. Um, so what, what Clara and I ended up doing is developed a six week course um, for our colleagues in design and editorial and, and development um, teams um, who basically the aim of the course was not to kind of get people um, like to be data scientists in six weeks or to like know statistics in um, six simple hour long lessons. Um, that was sort of, that's not the aim, but it's simply to get people sort of to understand the basics of art, but geared towards data visualization. So geared towards like producing graphics using the cookbook and the package. Um, and um, it involves a bit of work from people sort of to commit to working like an hour a day maybe on this. We go through things with them in a week, in an hour long session a week, but then they'd have sort of tasks to complete, homework, tutorials to go through, added links. So it does require a lot of work from the people who commit to it, but we've had great results from it. We're going through sort of a, our third cohort now, but there's essentially people who started um, a f um, two, three months ago with absolutely no knowledge of R who are now sort of using R to produce graphics daily. Um, and one of the interesting things f that's come about from that is that um, after learning R to produce graphics, they've kind of gone the inverse way um, that we've sort of learned R in that we would, we'd first used it for data analysis and then moved into producing graphics. Um, the people who learn R to make graphics are now looking at it for data analysis as well, the more they get used to it. So that's been really interesting to see from our point of view as well. Um, 
so yeah, essentially here are the um, a few links to the um, bbplot package that you can download and is open source uh, and the cookbook. So you could sort of um, start up, get up and going um, pretty pretty um, quickly. Um, as Cara mentioned, we open sourced it last month and we've got some really good feedback from it. Um, so any feedback sort of do get in touch with us. Um, and it's been really cool to see that even sort of within a few um, weeks of releasing it, there's, just, we were checking sort of Twitter before we came and there's loads of people who've already used it to create graphics, which has been really, really great to see, um, see it out in the world sort of thing. So hopefully we've managed to like give back something to the community, which has been so helpful in like so many people uh, writing tutorials and sort of helped us out in our path. So if it helps out a few people getting started with making sort of graphics in our, um, we've sort of achieved our target really. So yeah, that's all. Thank you so much, Clara and Nassos. Um, we've got time for five minutes of questions. So if anybody has a question, Liz is going to pass this mic around. And I think we might have another one. And uh, I will try and spot you. So lady right down the end, right at the other end of this front row. Hello, um, it looks really amazing. I work as an art director at CNN Digital and that, that does look really incredible. Um, I was just wondering if I missed it, is there a CMS or a front facing kind of interface that people use to make the graphics or do they literally work with the code in the cookbook? Um, no, so we, this is literally um, kind of working within within R and R studio to write the code to generate the graphics. Um, so we've tried to actually kind of actively try to keep the package from becoming too much like a chart tool because I think one of the really like strong benefits of ggplot is kind of the freedom that you have with it um, to kind of uh, to kind of set your own visual style and to really kind of think about how you want that chart to look. So we did kind of try to um, try to leave as much as possible of that in and only kind of only automate the things that you were definitely going to need for every chart, like left aligning the title or adding in the adding in the source, things like that. Um, but we didn't want we didn't want to automate like the entire process of making the chart. If that makes so sense. So, do you have any QC at the end before it kind of goes to publish, just to check like the styling is? You do, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, <laughs> and before we before we kind of um, published the. Um, the package and or even like shared it amongst our team we kind of had a very thorough design check of it as well just to make sure that the all of the style was consistent with mm. the kind of bbc style uh in-house styles basically thank you oh would be <laughs> of course <laughs> exercise for you please oh no stop oh, thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hi, I'm James, The Economist. Uh, really inspiring stuff. Um, congratulations. Um, firstly, uh, I wanted to ask um, who, who, who kind of bought into it further up the BBC and how did you find both the time and the headspace to create this? Um, how many hours collectively did it take and how long did it take? And how many, how many lines of code are there? Is there? Um, I think sort of for a lot of people outside sort of the internal team, it doesn't really matter how we produce graphics. So it didn't kind of need buy-in in that point of view because as long as we're working and producing the graphics and they look nice and they do the trick, it's not something that we needed to sort of check with people. We, As a team, we produce graphics anyway. Um, so it's just an internal shift in the way we produce graphics that ticks a few more boxes in terms of being smoother, being quicker, and being much more reproducible. So that kind of didn't really come into it. Um, in, um, I have no idea, lines of code and hours. It, I, I think, as sort of mentioned, the benefit was that like we I don't, I can't put my finger on exactly why, but we started like sharing things and sharing the code really quickly. It happened sort of orga organically so that if someone's like, I'm really stuck on this, I can't work this out. Um, they would sort of 
share their problems and um, that really helped sort of speed things along. So it wasn't one person that wasn't doing any project work, wasn't doing any data analysis. It was just a few of us trying to solve things together. But I think it, it also worked in that we were targeting like we want to do a graphic from our, for this project and for this project. So we had somewhere to, something to aim at. Um, we, or we want to build the um, graphic for the gender pay gap because we're going to have to be updating it every sort of few hours as the data comes in. We want to build it in a more reproducible way. Um, so we had something to focus on in the target. And at the same time, it hasn't sort of changed. It's changed the way we produce static graphics, but we'll still use like for interactives and calculators, we we'll still use like D3 where it's applicable. We'll still use the chart tool where it's the, the, it's just quicker to do um, something and it doesn't need annotating and it doesn't need things like that. So there's still other ways that we'd go about producing graphics. This is just one shift from the data team's point of view, really. Um, yeah. Hi, um, I teach at the University of Melbourne. So I'm really interested in how you designed the syllabus for your colleagues and also in under what arrangement it was that people came onto that training? Did they self-nominate or were they put forward? How did that work? Um, so <laughs> it was sort of, ba it was not a very strategic um, syllabus, I would say. It was kind of put together by, by me and Nassos who, I think like it was quite beneficial to us that we had like learned our ourselves relatively recently. It was made it a little bit easier to kind of explain the basics. Um, <clears throat> And in terms of in terms of how we kind of set aside that time, so um, we were teaching um, kind of close colleagues within the kind of wider visual journalism team that we sit in. Um, so and they were the people who um, who expressed interest in it were kind of approved by their closest manager to to kind of participate in that. And we did ask to like have a set amount of hours set aside every week to be able to make the most of it. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, essentially, the framework was also that it was one hour. We'd be we'd sit with them for an hour to go through the main concepts, and there was a lot of material that they then needed to go through and solve like homework exercises for the week. So it wasn't like we'll meet every day. It was kind of here's week one concept. What the hell is R and how you how how does it work? Week two is as basic as like importing data into R, and. Um, then they would have the whole week. We'd set up a Slack channel with them so they could ask us questions or just come to us. So it, was, it wasn't like we weren't talking to them daily, but whenever they had questions, they could come to us and ask. And if they'd, um, they, w they'd work with their line managers to allocate a bit of time sort of for them to go through the course. They were on this course for six weeks, and it ended with a workshop where we have a whole afternoon to go through from start to finish how we'd make graphics with them, which sort of brings everything together. At the same time, if they don't keep on using it and they don't actively start using it to make graphics, then it's sort of it's it's not gonna be it's not gonna stick after six weeks. They've got to be invested in like actually sort of trying to you know spend a few painful hours trying to learn things and debugging things with our help, obviously. But it does need that investment in their time that it's going to be a bit of a struggle for a while, but it's going to be okay at the other end. And the fact that we can show them, here's what you'll get at the other end, helps as well, helps sort of focus. Yeah. Just take two questions at once, if that's okay. So if you wouldn't mind asking your question, and then ladies back at the back can ask questions and then answer them both. <laughs> and then that'll be the questions and the questions. Um, so I was wondering how cognitive biases related to data visualization influence how you develop the package, if in any way. And if not, if you just relied on, you know, how ggplot might deal with some of the things, how do you do that in the team? How do you check that you're not presenting the, the data in a biased way? Hello, lovely work, by the way. Um, I was wondering how the data team felt about their colleagues making graphics and whether you were happy for them to, to roam free and create those or if there was any checks in place. Um, how do you kind of control that? And the second part was whether you're going to ever put your six week syllabus on as an open source kind of tool for other people as well. Thank you. Um, so I'll answer those in reverse order, I think. Um, so um, the blog or the, the kind of uh, learning resources that we have at the moment are not 
public because there's some like data that isn't in the public domain, so we haven't been able to haven't been able to just set it live. Um, but it's definitely something that we're thinking about, and hopefully we'll be able to to release like an updated version of. Um, in terms of the kind of checks that are in place, I mean, they kind of remain the, the same as as they do for our other graphics. That is always kind of looked over by, for instance, like looked over by a designer to make sure that it passes um, color blindness tests and things like that, and just generally that <laughs> that the chart looks okay. Um, so I think that the, the checks kind of remain the same, no matter how the the graphic has been produced, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, and um, f further to that, there's sort of pretty good um, resources written by sort of more qualified people on on learning R as well. So there's no shortage of courses, um, so you don't have to wait for, for ours to be open source to start learning. Um, but um, in terms of, I'm not 100% sure I sort of fully understand your question. Um, I'll attempt it, and if I've got it totally wrong, you can let me know. Um, essentially, I, I kind of think we're... Um, We've not started kind of making visualizations from scratch. We've sort of, there's lots of trained data visualization practitioners within our team. There's sort of designers part of our team who are sort of trained in um, um, data visualization and how people interpret data that have had a lot of input into kind of how we um, how we've developed the styles in this package. So it's not as if we're sort of starting from scratch and just throwing things together. In that point of view, there's been a lot of QC fr from there. But in terms of how we'd kind of work together, it was how we'd put it together. And it was pretty much kind of using the fundamental ggplot functions that come with it, but styled up for for our own sort of use. I don't know if that if that really answers the yeah. question. Sure. Way, visually, yep. By, like, if you do bubbles, yep. people get confused. Yeah. Twice or three, four times, or sure. Yeah. I, I was wondering how you, like, because journalism is very important. Like, yep. The way you present the data, you're not actually, you know, mm. kind of leading into even higher biases and how you do Sure. It. So the question for people who can't hear it is, um, is no, it's fine, is how, um, how you can how you're presenting data and whether that is leading to biases in the way that that data is read. Um, I don't know if you have a lengthy answer to that, but we've got to stick to time. So if you've got a very quick answer to it, then go yeah. for it. I, I think that doesn't change the fundamental principles that we work with in how we visualize and present data, which will sort of check with a lot of people and still fit in. It, it should still go through the normal QCs and make sure that we get it right. We do sort of labor over the graphics that we do. It's not because we can produce them quicker that we necessarily sort of leave out the checks and balances and the sort of thinking behind it that we do that. So we still go through that. Okay, thank you so much, Clara Nassos. Thank you.